ショーン・コネリー、あの、ワリバー、あどうぞよろしくお願いします。あい、What is it that I like to be a voice director and transformers? What do you like most about Hollywood? What do you use your favorite flavor underwear? What do you like to do most for production? Do you like、uh, everything else in the world? What do you、uh, perform? あ、どうぞ。Actually, I'm, I'm no celebrity, as you probably can see. But I am a voiceover director, and my name is Wally Byrne. I voice directed the G1 series.、Uh, my friend here is someone you probably recognize, Mr. Shake Hands Man, better known as Tadao Tomomatsu. And he's a dyed in the wool Transformer fan. So he's going to ask some questions, and I'm going to attempt to answer them. Well, thank you for being with us、uh, here today, Wally. And、uh, why don't we start out with. How did you get started in this wild and wacky business? You don't want to go back that far. Okay, well, we'll start with the more recent. How, how did you get started、uh, doing voiceover work? No, I, I was at Northwestern University. I flunked out of pre med because I wasn't very bright. I could talk. So I got into the School of Speech at Northwestern, which is a very prominent institution.、Uh, started in radio after I graduated,、uh, did a little live television as a performer, and.、Uh, Realized that you make mistakes all the time and they can't be fixed in live television. There was no tape then. And、uh, from that, I said, I- I'm going to get into film. Film is going to be the place where you can fix things. And、uh, that got me over into、uh, working as a commercial director.、Mm-hmm. And、uh, then I eventually got into the advertising business as a producer director. And、uh, at one point, Hanna Barbera said, Would you like to come with us? And I was delighted to do that. And、uh, started doing、uh, commercials for them, but、uh, decided I wanted to get into the voiceover end of it as, as a director. And I started、uh, voice directing the shows、uh, Super Friends, Scooby Doo, shows like that. I didn't do all of them, but I did many of them. How did you get started with Transformers?、Um, let's go back just a little bit. G.I.、Okay. Joe,、uh, the producer. Was so busy on the set, he had directed the voice director of the first episode, and he called me and he said, I need help. I'm, I'm tied up with design and layout and that sort of thing. And I said, What can I do? He said, You can direct the next show, the number two show. I did, and uh, uh, not to be vain, but I, I'm very pleased with this. I, I blew their socks off. And,、wow. uh, and from then on, they, they had a meeting and they said, You're our guy for the rest of whatever. And so I did the rest of the G.I. Sh- Joe shows, what, 72, 75, something like that.、Mm-hmm. And then along came Transformers, and we did 92 of those. And then along came another series of shows,、uh, Hasbro material.、Mm-hmm. And、uh, that was what kicked it off. So、uh, I did over 500 shows for,、uh, for Hasbro and Marvel.、Okay. Most people are, are wondering how does、uh, production work、uh, in voiceover? How do, you, how do you get around to doing. Voiceover for animation? What's, what's the process?、Um, Nancy Cartwright, you know who she is?、Uh, Nancy Cartwright. Ah, she is the she, voice of Bart、uh, um, Simpson.、Yeah, yeah. Yes. I haven't worked with her, but she wrote me when she was at the, in Ohio in school,、mm-hmm. in college, and said, How do you get into voiceover?、Right. And I wrote her back a simple letter. I said, Have wheels. This is a wheels town, Los Angeles. You、yes. can't do it otherwise.、Uh, have six months' rent ready to go. And have a lot of uh, uh, self confidence.、Mm-hmm. And one day she showed up in my studio with a letter held in front of her. It was the letter I had responded with,、mm-hmm. telling her those things. And she took it down like that. And she said, You remember me? I said, I have no idea who you are. And now she's, she's been one of the most successful actresses in voiceover.、Mm-hmm. And my point is, she started very early. She started doing strange voices when she was in high school, or maybe even earlier than that. Dawes Butler, who was Yogi Bear and Huckleberry Hound. Again, from the very beginning, he was doing, imitating other characters and, and doing voices. So、mm-hmm. it's something to start early on and, and to work very hard at. So if you get into it later.、Mm-hmm. But a lot of people have the impression that it's not acting. They'll say, I, I only do voiceover, I'm not acting. That, that's, that, that's a misconception because、mm-hmm. good voiceover work is very much acting.、Mm-hmm. It's not just reading a script. It's kind of nice that you don't have to memorize your lines. This is true. <laughs>、yeah. So,、um, in production,、uh, let's say you're doing a Transformers、uh, show. 
uh, how, do you do you go ahead and start with the you you cast the voices as well? I, well, start with I, I I audition the talent and, mm -hmm. and I bring in people that I'm comfortable with and are in the ballpark for mm -hmm. the actors. Uh, I record them. I usually design a little piece like 15 seconds of dialogue to test them in the character that we're testing. And we mm -hmm. test them for, for several different characters, but let's say it's just one. And uh, that's put on tape and it's sent to uh, the advertising agency and this, call, uh, this was Griffin Bacall at that time. Mm -hmm. And then they bring it to uh, Hasbro, who I'm sure in most cases said, hey, whatever you guys like. And it was selected and then we made a deal for that actor. Everybody worked pretty much for scale back then, and, mm -hmm. and still do. Um, in any case, um, the man would be set, uh, make sure that his agent's happy with the arrangement, and then we'd start the show, and uh, that goes back into where do I get the yes. material. Okay. Um, I, I first see a storyboard, which is, we'll show one here shortly, but... Uh, mm -hmm. The storyboard is is a visualization of the continuity, where they go to a close-up, where they zoom, and where they pan, and so on. I study that very hard, and then I'm given a dialogue script, which is a, 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 a typed copy of just the dialogue, not the scene descriptions, but it's it's just a dialogue script. And it's I mark like the TV script. It, it doesn't have the the character turns left, turns right. Sort no, of thing. no, no right? description at all. Okay. So that the when the actor's given that, mm -hmm. for, for for some reason historically. Actors in animation, actors in voiceover, don't get the script until they're there on the job, which I think is a mistake, but th that's, that's one of the pressures of the business. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas with a live action show, the actors get their scripts maybe three or four days in, in advance mm -hmm. and can rehearse them. But actors in voiceover kind of come in, you say, here's what you're doing, here's what the scene is like, uh, let's try it once. And if they're on the, uh, on the, on the button with it, uh, we'll go ahead and do the scene. If not, I may say, I need you a little bit louder, a little more physical, a little more <laughs> disturbed, whatever, that, that works with the storyboard I have tested. I mean, I have, right. I've, I've worked with very carefully. And um, we then start doing sections, mm -hmm. piece by piece. If somebody makes a mistake, Let's hold it. Let's try it again. Would you please be a little more careful with such and such? Now, uh, Transformers had a tremendous number of cast members. Uh, lots of largest show there. I've ever been involved with. Now, yeah. Nowadays, when you look at modern films or modern animations, they usually just do the individual ones. How is is that the same way they did it for Transformers? No, we we did it. Kind of the best best comparison is if if you know anything about old time radio drama. Mm -hmm. All the actors were there standing in front of mics, and it was done what we call ensemble form, that uh, everybody was on the, on the set to do it. When you got around to celebrities, because they're so damn busy, you usually had to call them in individually, which I, I've never liked, uh, but uh, uh, because you, it, you get a better performance if everybody's working off of the other actors. But with celebrities, you, you, you treat them nicely, bring them in individually, and uh, send them a limo. Ah, <laughs> so how do you cast for shows like Transformers? Uh, first, I go through the, the, the cast breakdown, find out how many characters of what kind there are. Then I'll call agents and say, hey, I need a bad guy with a hoarse voice. I need a young kid. I need this, that, and the other thing. The agent will suggest what kinds of uh, characters he might have that would fit this, we'll discuss it a little bit, and then we'll set a date and bring the people who seem to, to, to fill a bill for us into the studio, read them, put them on tape, send the tape back to New York. They say, yeah, fine, no, we don't want him. And uh, they probably show it to Hasbro. I think Hasbro probably always said, hey, whatever you guys think. Because I never saw a Hasbro person in the entire 500 shows that I did for, uh, for Hasbro. Never saw a Hasbro representative. It was all between the ad agency and, and uh, myself as far as the voices are concerned. Eventually, though, you, you decide on the voices and uh, start the show. It's, uh, it, it's t a tedious process, and you listen to a lot of people doing the same thing over and over again, but it has to be done, and it's very valuable because if you don't, sometimes producers want it, let's get this casting out of the way. If you don't go through the, the hard stuff of doing the casting, you're going to end up making some big mistakes. Mm -hmm. um, this is what I call a cast plot. All it is is a, uh, 
a device to keep the actors and the characters straight. And if I want to change an actor, uh, have him do another part, I just move a check mark over rather than have to retype a whole list. Mm -hmm. So I can tell how many lines he has, when he's going to be finished, all sorts of information come off of this. It's called a cast plot. What are you doing nowadays? Oh, yeah. Uh, games, and they are kind of fun. They tend to be a little dislocated. You have to do uh, uh, 90 takes of everything, so they've got the, the, the same responses said with a question, the same response said with a statement, da 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 da, da. And I've uh, been doing a, a children's show uh, for television, or no, excuse me, for the Internet. Uh, has teaching elements in it where we had uh, uh, three ladies and two guys doing all of the voices, and the ladies were playing children, which is what uh, usually when you have a a young voice like a 10 year old boy, you get a lady to do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's what I've been doing and seeking more game work. So. Wonderful. So, Wally, tell us a little about the actors you worked with, like Peter Cullen, who played Optimus Prime. Peter is, a, as you know, an extremely distinctive voice and has done promos, that is, feature film uh, trailers that are shown in the theaters, mm -hmm. and uh, broadcast promos for a long time. That's his, that's his main business. Mm -hmm. uh, so we called him because he had this very deep voice, and uh, they loved him. And we got doing the show, and I would asked him to speak louder. There are a lot of shouting in Transformers shows. And I'd say, the, the guy you're talking to is way over there, so you got to scream. And he'd turn, and he'd say, Wally, I don't scream. <laughs> and I'd say, but you... So finally, we compromised, and he was a quiet, dignified Optimus Prime, which I think became one of the primary factors in what kind of a personality he portrayed for the show. Mm -hmm. um, who else? Uh, Frank Welker. Oh, Welker is it? Frank Welker. Fra Frank Welker is, is the most gentlemanly, beautiful to work with, can do anything guy in the business. Probably the most famous voiceover actor I've ever worked with, and I worked with him a lot. Uh, he was. Uh, uh, a 17 year old second buddy to the owner of Scooby Doo. You remember who, who, who owned Scooby Doo? Uh, Shaggy. Yeah, Shaggy's buddy, the, the kid. He did that. Oh, he, wow. in, in Inspector Gadget, he did the claw like that. And I mean, ah. the spookiest damn voice you've mm -hmm. ever heard. So he could do anything, including animals. And um, I don't think I ever heard him do a lady, but he, he was flexible. <laughs> he was a beautiful man to work with. Let's take a little sideways step to, uh, you voice directed Transformers the movie. Yeah. You worked with many yeah. famous actors in there, Orson Welles and Leonard Nimoy. Um, tell us a little about Leonard Nimoy. Uh, one of the Trekkies. Yep. Uh, Mr. Nimoy came in, and this is one thing I find very difficult. With celebrities, I'd like to take a lunch, just so we get to know how we talk and how he feels about what we're going to do. It's very difficult to ever have that happen. But uh, And I've said to myself, I am never going to work with a celebrity again unless I can have lunch or a little meeting so that we can kind of get a little bit acquainted instead of coming in, hi, I'm Wally Burr, you're so-and-so, and bang, you go off. It's, it's very uncomfortable for both myself and for the actor. In any case, Mr. Nimoy came in kind of under those circumstances. I'd never met him. and he asked, what, what, what are we doing here? So I explained an outline of the sequences he was going to be in. And uh, eventually, I, I finished up that, and I said, shall we do it? He said, yeah, get your director, and let's do it. <laughs> now, I still don't know. I, th I think he was putting me on. I think he was said, yeah, all right, I'm going to have fun with the kid. But um, he um, then did the stuff very, very nicely. But that, that little thing is always stuck in my mind. Did he know I was the director <laughs> or didn't he? He was pulling your leg. It, yeah. would, it would only seem logical. I think, I think he was pulling my leg. Uh, Orson Welles. You have this story about Orson Welles. Yeah. Uh, a man that everyone has a tremendous amount of respect for. A man that was also very difficult to work with. Mm. And that was because he was a very bright man and didn't have a lot of patience with uh, uh, things being done slowly or improperly. He could, he did a lot of commercials as a voiceover, and there are tapes running around the industry. People have them in their drawers that um, have Mr. Wells just slicing and dicing the people yeah. in the booth, the agency people. Mm -hmm. the, yeah, who's that? Get him out of there. Wow. You know, I mean, really, really mean. And uh, I think that comes from certain aspects of your talent. You come in, you don't know whether these people are going to record you well, so you want to take charge right, right, right. away. So, uh, can you tell us a little more about Orson Welles? What happened when he arrived for the recording session? Mr. Welles was a tremendous personality, tremendous amount of ego, 
which I've always kind of felt he had a, a right to exert because he was very bright. In any case, we sent a limo for him for this session. I think we had him for three hours in the studio. Mm -hmm. And uh, the limo pulled up and no Mr. Wells. Oh dear. And I, I said to the driver, what, what's going on? He said, oh, he, he wanted to come in his own automobile. So um, I noticed the, the driver of the limo going back to the, the rear trunk, what do you call it, a bonnet in some other country? Boot. The boot, yes. Boot and uh, opening it up, but I didn't. I saw Mr. Wells coming at about that point, and his car pulled up, and he, he weighed probably 300 pounds, so it took him a minute or so to get out of the car and get standing on his feet. And then I thought, the, uh, the, the wheelchair, what's that all about? Is he sick? And... Um, I realized that he, he was not sick. He could, he could get around. He just wanted a chair that was comfortable, and he couldn't find a chair for his rather large posterior that would fit him. So he had a special custom-made uh, wheelchair, and he gestured like that to the driver. The driver knew what that meant, took it into the studio, put it in front of the table where Mr. Wells was going to work. And then I said, Mr. Wells, can we go through a few lines here and just give the engineer a level on your voice? Certainly, he sat down and he took his script. And uh, I didn't tell him that Leonard Nimoy was doing dialogue with him, responding to his part. Uh, I, I let it go because I wanted to find out whether Mr. Wells actually had looked at the script, just for my own knowledge. I wasn't going to be critical of it. Mm -hmm. In any case, uh, I, I started reading Nimoy's lines and Wells stopped. And he looked down and he said, you're not going to line read me, are you? Line reading is a director telling an actor how to say it, as opposed to saying you need to be more intense. Um, in any case, it's it's a for, it's verboten in most cases, but sometimes it's the fastest way to get from here to there is to read it. Many actors don't mind. Many actors hate it. In any case, he did he hated it, and he said, "You're line reading me." I said, "No, I wouldn't think of it." He said, "You're doing it," and he looked at me, and I thought, "Oh boy, here I go, S sliced and diced," and I said. No, I'm reading Mr. Nimoy's lines. Oh, so you are. The monkey dropped off my, <laughs> my back and jumped on his back. And uh, I was very amused by that. Then we went to the studio, did the session, and uh, eventually we started slating things. And I would slate from... Uh, I knew I wasn't going to direct him too much. I was just going to get the mechanics going. And at some point he finally said, I'll do the slating. <laughs> what? He didn't want any interruption. He, he wanted to control the situation entirely. Mm -hmm. And then I had one more comment before we wrapped the session, and that was, you're a little slow. Animation needs to be a little perkier, a little brighter, a little more dynamic than, um, than normal uh, live action acting. And um, he said, how can you possibly go any faster than I'm going now? And that's about the point where he said, I think, I'll do the slating. <laughs> yeah, was, You're out of the picture. <laughs> and um, uh, mm -hmm. everything was very smooth from then on, although my producer said, let him go. Don't, we don't <laughs> want to lose him. We don't want to get a temper tantrum going, which was fine. And eventually he ended, and then people started coming out from corners and nooks and behind curtains that had come to the session just to see the great man. And I said to uh, them on the talk back into the studio, uh, let's let Mr. Wells be. He's, he's worked very hard this afternoon. Please don't cry. He said, no, I, I enjoy talking to people. And he sat and held court for about 20 minutes, sitting in his wheelchair. Mm -hmm. People say, when are you going to finish Don Quixote? Um, when I get the money. Uh, are you going to have your next picture? He pulled his pocket inside out once and went, oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> money. And that's why he would do almost any kind of job as, as a narrator and so on. But uh, he, had, uh, he, he was very difficult to work with, I think, in most cases because of this tremendous ego. Anyhow, um, uh, he, he was extremely charming and uh, delightful, delighted with the, the, the response he was getting from the people in the studio. Mm -hmm. And uh, eventually he got back on his uh, feet, went to his car, which was waiting outside, and... Uh, got in and it went off into the distance and uh, but uh, three weeks later um, Mr. Wells died of a heart attack and uh, I, I was kidded that I was the one who killed him no but uh, I, I really did admire him and he, he could be difficult to work he was he was a fantastic talent mm -hmm. I understand this is uh, an interesting prop from that 
Yeah. Oh, yeah, I almost yeah. forgot it. This is the glass that we I bought to put on his table to kind of help to make friends. He, he, he was the spokesman for Schweppes, and he was the spokesman for a prominent wine in uh, this country. And uh, so he was known for that. And I put this and a, in a, in a, uh, a bottle of Schweppes beside it, <laughs> and I think he was appreciative of it. Right. One of my favorite uh, props and so souvenirs. This is this is this is the Wells actual this is the actual glass that he drank. Wow! From. So the the last one from from his work. There was also a rumor about uh, after uh, Orson Welles had passed that Leonard Nimoy was doing some pickup poison. Wrong. I, I've heard that okay. rumor so many times. Uh, Mr. Wells finished his part completely and to everyone's satisfaction, other than the fact we had to speed him up 10% and then pitch him back down so he still sounded like Orson Welles. But that's, that's an, an ordinary procedure. But Mr. Nimoy did his part, and he never doubled anything of, uh, of Wells' character. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Wally, for, for taking the time with Been us fun. today here, Been and, and I hope you've had a great time. And I'd and, uh, like to thank all the Transformer fans out there for sticking with the DVD, and i like to thank uh, Madman for, for having us on for the day. You going to take me to lunch? Uh, no, I let the bosses take us to lunch. <laughs> okay. We'll see what happens. Then. Thank you.